So many of you want to go and become, become doctors or teachers or you know something like that. That's, that's fine, but you don't know any better. But after this lecture, you'll all want to go into phylogenetics. Okay, this is what I do. So I spend my time on. This is really amazing. Um, you'll also fi find out why this is funny. Uh, anyone find a solution? Find a solution. Five mixed fruit or six, seven mixed fruit. Seven mixed fruit. Yeah, that's one of the solutions. Another solution too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's, that's the other solution I found. Yeah, good. Now there's, there might be more too, but excellent, nicely, nicely done. And so the, the key thing here is it's very easy to verify if that's a solution or not, add it up, see if it's right. right but it's very hard to find, find that solution. Okay, there's a huge class of problems like this um, that are easy to verify solutions, but har hard to find them. Okay, and lots of phylogenetic problems are in that set too. And so we'll talk more about that later. It's kind of cool. But first, Clickers. So, what does Acromyrmex eat? Oh, sorry, channel 51. Yes. This is a quiz where you get two points for right answer, one point for wrong answer, and no points if you don't come. So. Is everyone entered? And the correct answer is fungi. So it's a leaf cutter ant. So you think, oh, leaf cutter ants cut leaves. What they do is then feed it to fungi and eat the fungi itself. Okay. It's a really cool symbiosis. And we'll talk about symbiosis later in the semester. Okay. Yeah. Next question. <coughs> oh, what am I holding up? Ninety-three percent of you are getting it right. Everyone answered. Okay. The correct answer is ammonite. Very cool. Good. Any questions about that? Okay. Phylogenetics. So this is a I made with the number of papers per year showing phylogen, phylogenetics, phylogeny through time. Okay. And you see, shooting way up. Um, <coughs> and so it's becoming very, very common. And here you also see these show the overlap between phylogenetics and papers that also talk about evolutionary ecology. And at first, phylogenetics starts off as a sort of pimple on the side of evolution, and now it's become you know a huge ball that overlaps ecology and evolution. Okay, so very, very important. So we talked about this last time, right? So phylogeny, you have a species, splits, we represent that as A and B, okay? And it's a series of nestings, right? These form a group that's a clade, these form a group that's a clade, these form a group that's a clade. Okay. Now, one thing to note is that phylogenies are sort of an idealized representation of what's actually happening, right? So on the left, we see a, a true history. Right, and we see population size changing through time. We see things going extinct. We see population subdivision, so things being broken up into different populations that only rarely exchange individuals. 
we see a gradual re reduction in gene flow. I talked about yesterday that a mountain slowly coming up, so you eventually go to over less and less. Right? We see hybridization. Right? We see this in sunflowers and fish and lo lots of different plants, actually. We see introgression. So it's two separate species, but occasionally we have gene flow going from one to the other. Okay. So all these processes are going on. We tend to summarize them as just this kind of tree. Okay. So some simplification that happens there. One actually very active area of research right now is dealing with the hybridization issue. So if you have species that are hybrids, how can you deal with them on a tree? Okay. So there's ways to both infer trees and also use that information to look at character evolution. So how do you make a phylogeny? Well, here's one general pathway. Say, I want, to make a I want to make a phylogeny of green plants. And we typically nowadays use genetic data. Okay. Where do you get genetic data? Well, everyone who publishes a paper that uses genetic data is required to put it on a repository called GenBank. Um, so it used to be that you, you know, you'd have your, you publish your paper, and you keep your data on your own hard drive, someone could ask you for the data, and if your hard drive hadn't been erased or you didn't, you know, or did something like that, you could then send them the data, or you might not. Right? So it's not a really good way of exchanging data that way. But with genetic data now, people are required to put it onto a database. And then anyone in the world, you can right now go and download the entire database onto your computer and use all the data, okay? um, <coughs> which makes it great for reuse. And so that database is called GenBank. And so you can say, I want to use these five genes. And these five genes might be evolving at a good rate for inferring the evolutionary history. So you get those genes. You can filter them. Maybe there's an error in some of the genes. Maybe people have mislabeled something. Okay? You can text, tech, test and fix orthology. So there's processes like gene duplication that can cause confusion. So you can sort of filter that out. You can do more filtering then. You can align the data. So we know that an A in this gene corresponds to a T in this gene, okay? which can be hard as, as genes increase or decrease in length. It's hard to do. Do another alignment, and then you can infer a phylogeny using one of various methods. Okay, so all this is just to get a set of genetic data, and use that genetic data to figure out the phylogeny. Okay. And so <coughs> here we see, um, through time, the amount of different methods that are used. So here are the methods in the color, and here are the programs that are used. Okay, so parsimony means you get the tree that implies the fewest changes. Okay, so you can say, you know, this tree says that eyes evolve 15 times. This tree says eyes evolve twice. It's probably more likely to use that tree. Okay, um, these tr purple uses distance. So distance is the way we say. Um, I look at my pairwise distance between every pair of taxa. So we're, we're you know, 0.5% different, well, different from chimpanzees and 2% different from gorilla and so forth. And you try to summarize those distances as a tree. Okay. Likelihood uses a model. And you say the probability of my data is maximized under this tree. Okay. We can get to that later. Um, Bayes uses the model but also uses prior belief. If you, so if you, if you know something going into it, you can use that belief to affect your result. Okay. So you thought this is how people learn things too. So if I said to you, you know, I flew here with using my arms, right? With likelihood, I say that's all the data I have. Sure, okay, you flew here. With Beige, you say, I have a very pretty strong prior belief that you did not do that. So I need a lot of evidence to convince me that you flew here with your arms. Right? So it's possible, but you had enough evidence, but you had to, you know, overcome this big prior first. That's the Bayesian approach. And there's also miscellaneous approaches. As you see, you know, approaches vary through time. The Bayesian ones took off recently. Um, and you can see what programs are being used, various programs. So most of these are now free. So all the stuff, you, you know, you can download on your computer all of the all genetic data for all organisms that we know. And then you can get, you know, top of the line program for free and start running. Okay. So this cartoon, what, what's this about? Well, if we're doing something like parsimony, trying to find the tree that's shortest, right? Um, I can say to you, there is a tree that describes these data that is only requires five changes. Okay, now folk, go find that tree. Right? That's hard to do. How do you go find that tree? Once I give you a tree, like this tree, unless I have this, and I say 
you know, how many changes does this tree have? You can say, oh, it has to have change here and change here. Okay, so I had to have an ancestor hit of zero, 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 zero. That's one possible way of putting changes on that tree. Right? That tree has two changes. There's no way to put one change on that tree or th and have it, you know, work. Right? To have to get to these these tip states. Okay, so I can say there's a tree that has exactly two. You can find this tree, but I could propose different trees um, that would have different numbers of changes on them. Okay, and so the the key thing is it's hard to find a tree like this, but then once you find it, it's easy to calculate the score. Okay, and the class of problems that basically can't be solved in polynomial time. Um, so it, in basic computer science, how fast does it take you to solve something? Some things, yeah, as you add more and more, it grows um, factorially. That's bad. It grows exponentially. That's okay. It grows linearly. That's great. Right? So with trees, the problem space grows factorially. Okay, it just gets very scary very soon. We'll come to this in, in a minute. Okay? But figuring out, the ant figuring out for a given tree with score is very fast. Okay? And if you can figure... And one thing is that people actually don't know for this tree problem or for like even the restaurant problem, is there a fast algorithm that will help you solve it? And if you can find a fast algorithm, there's a prize that will give you a million dollars. So if you can figure out a fast way of solving this that will scale well with time, you get a million dollars. If you can prove that there is no such algorithm, you also get a million dollars. Right? right now, the, the way they feel is we don't know whether there is or isn't. Okay? And so this problem comes all over the place. It comes up, you know, if you're trying to figure out in your GPS, what's the best way to go from here to there to there? That's a problem of this kind. If I'm building a circuit board and saying, where should I drill the hole? Should I drill this way first, or should I drill this way first? That's also a problem of this kind. It can go all over the place, right? So you can go to see if you can get a million dollars this weekend. Um, many people have tried. No one has succeeded yet. Okay? But a lot of tree problems are like this, where it's easy to verify a solution, but finding a solution is really, really hard. <coughs> What can you do trees of? Well, you can do trees of animals or plants. All right, so here's a mammal tree. And this is a summary of a bigger tree that has almost all, all mammals on it. It's been like 50 or so mammals. Okay. But note it has areas, we talked about polytomies the other day, areas like here, right, where there's a big polytomy, where you have one node that has multiple, multiple descendants. And what that typically means is that they know this, this is probably a bifurcating tree, you know, each node having two descendants. They don't know which bifurcating tree it is. And so they summarize that as a polytomy, okay, saying this is uncertainty. Oh, yeah. right? So I mean, you could have made, it, made a tree of all life without data and have it a big polytomy. Right? Not very interesting. So as you get more data, you can start to resolve that tree better and better. But trees are also, also aren't just for organisms. They're for other things that evolve. Right? So here we have a tree of languages. Okay? And so human language evolves, too. Okay. There's been trees done for books. So if you take, you know, old books that were copied hand by hand, well, those copying, you know, monks drift off to sleep or something, they make little errors. And the next month copying it copies that error. And so there's these, you know, series of copings with, you know, branching with, with changes. And what you can do is use those to make a tree of those manuscripts and figure out what the ancestral manuscript looked like before the monks started dozing off. Okay. So it's, trees are used all over the place. You know, here's a tree of, you know, all of life that we've been talking about. And this tree is calibrated at the time. So you can say, okay, what was living around 4.2 billion years ago? What was around, you know, 100 million years ago? And so forth. Okay. Now, tree space grows very, very fast. It's very, very terrifying. So, for example, here's a tree some friends of mine created that has 13, over 13,000 species on it. Okay. And it required 32 gigs of RAM to run. Now, trees, the number of possible trees for certain number taxa grows, grows up a lot. So here we see, you know, this is a log scale. Everyone okay with a log scale? Okay. Um, here we see something that doubles with every n, so it's increasing on that log scale. Here we see something that's going up by a factor of 10 each time. And here we see the number of trees. We're shooting up factorially. Okay, so first we have one tree, then there's three possible trees, then five, then seven, then nine, and so forth. It's going up that way. Right? Here's the number of atoms in the universe. Right? So if you wanted to look at <coughs> um, you know, a tree, all trees that have, say, 50 taxa, there are more possible trees there than there are atoms in the universe. 
right? The tree you just saw had 13,000 taxa, right? And so going through and looking at each possible tree take you a while, right? And we don't have any good algorithms that are guaranteed to give you the right tree um, within some certain back. Uh, so we have to do some, some heuristic searches. So searches that aren't guaranteed to give you the right answer, but often do. Okay. How much so, that, th back to that 13,000 tree, right? if, let's say we added two more taxa, how much does that increase the search space? Well, that tree is like, you know, finding the best tree is a scale of finding the best rubber duck on, on campus somewhere. Right? So if there's a campus, let's find the rubber duck. Adding two more taxa increases the search space such that it becomes searching for the rubber duck anywhere on the planet. Okay? So that's just, you know, campus, you know, we haven't picked campus, but still, campus to entire planet. We have a sense of how quickly this tree space expands. Right? So it's a lot of work in figuring out fast ways to look at that tree. Okay? Fast ways to find those trees. Um, even looking at the trees is hard. Okay? So here I have a tree of 13,000 names. Right? I just want to look at all those names in the tree. Like use your nice big HD TV, right? But that has just 1,900 pixels, right? And I'm able to show 13,000 names on, <coughs> with 1,900 pixels, right? So you have to somehow summarize it. Even using large computer monitors that can be tiled, you know, 30, 33,000 pixels, right? So you need to have a huge wall to be able to just read all the names. Okay, what we'll actually do? They cut and paste. Or they need to know about phylogenetics I learned in kindergarten. Right? They print out a big tree and sort of paste it together using tape. And this actually has pretty good resolution. You know, there's 100 pixels. And you can also tile it together. People have these huge trees they like mount on the wall, <coughs> this big set of trees they'll paste on the wall and look at them that way. Okay? And so even just looking at these things can be hard. Okay. So they're hard to build, they're hard to look at. Why do we care about them? You know, building stack pencils is hard too, but we don't do that. There's no point. Right, so why do you bother with phylogenetic trees? Well, they tell us lots about past life. Okay. So here's an example. Here I have five fly species, different different some traits, and I have a hypothesis. I say the orange ones feed on oranges. Now, did they become orange? So they can feed on oranges better, so they're camouflaged, or were they already that color and just happened to eat oranges? How can you tell this? Right? Now maybe if you find you know, fossils of them and you can detect color in the fossil, which happens rarely, like you know something about dinosaur feather color now, you could pick, pick that up, right? But with phylogenetics, you can tell the answer to this using just data you have here and other data you can get from excellent things. What you can do is you can build a tree and you can use parsimony. So parsimony minimizes changes. Okay, so for example, let's just look at body color. Here's a possible reconstruction. I can say, let me assume that this is orange, and this is this is orange, and this is this is orange, and this is this is purple. Okay, let's make that assumption. Let's map. So, how many changes of color does this tree imply? Two. Right. Good. So you have two changes. Right here and here. Is that the most parsimonious reconstruction possible? Is that the one that minimizes the changes? No. Awesome. Okay. What can I do instead? Start out with purple. Everything else is purple and this one orange? Okay. Awesome. And so now we have one change. It's more parsimonious. <coughs> okay. And now, if this is true, we can know where that change happened, right? It happened in that part of the tree. Okay. And so back to our hypothesis about orange color, right? Let's go back to the tree. If our tree is calibrated to time, okay, so that the branch lengths represent the amount of time, millions of years, okay, this kind of tree is called a chronogram, okay, say scale like that. If we know that orange has evolved here, right, and these are orange there, how does this address our hypothesis? Okay. 
could have that change because it's after mm -hmm. Orange was there. But then you have the question of how quickly could that influence that change. Right, but does it reject a hypothesis? No. So it's, our hypothesis isn't rejected. Right, we don't know the hypothesis is true. We just haven't rejected it yet. Right. So, so it's consistent with the hypothesis. So I'm going to say, oh, maybe it's still in play. If this were the tree, here's the reconstruction. We'll just do our hypothesis. <coughs> mm -hmm. Exactly. So here, have an orange color evolving before orange fruit does, right? Which suggests that you know the process isn't, isn't met. So this is cool, right? So now we, we have a tree. We have observations of organisms. We can make inferences about what's happening millions of years ago. Millions of years ago, were these flies orange and eating oranges, or were they not? Right, you can figure that out using a tree. Now, one thing I'm not showing you here is uncertainty. Right? There's great uncertainty with all this, and we could have had, you know, it is possible to have two changes, like have a change here and here, say. Right? If you figure out what the probability of that is and take that into account. Okay? So it's more complex than this. This gives you a flavor of how you can use, use this information to understand past history. Okay? So another example we had earlier in class was those frogs. I remember the frogs calling and reconstructing ancestral frog calls, like, mm, mm, right, and playing with each other. Right? So that's another case where you can use a tree to reconstruct what's going on. Okay. So one thing you can do is do something like this. So you can estimate ancestral states using this method. So this is using likelihood. So using an actual a model of evolution and using that model to estimate what's going on back in time. Another example of method is testing for two binary traits. So if I get trait X, does that lead to trait Y? Okay. So there's a cool example of using this with human societies and looking at people who herd or don't herd cattle and looking at matrilineal versus patrilineal, whether you inherit things from your mother or inherit things from your father's side. And groups that had cattle um, that were tended by men, their inheritance tended to be patrilineal. And you can see actually which happened first. Did you first evolve um, tending cattle and then evolve patrilineal? Or did you become patrilineal and then men started tending cattle? So you can actually test that using a tree of human societies. Okay. Um, <coughs> and so let's look at that. There are many stretching models for trees. Okay. So if we think that change happens on a tree proportional to time, right, or some rate, we can say, well, what if that rate changed over the tree? As equivalent to just sort of stretching certain parts of the tree. Right? So I think that this clade of animals is evolving faster. If that's true, that's like making those branches longer, giving more time to change. Okay? So all these set of methods that allow you to stretch a tree to test these ideas. Okay? So <coughs> um, one is, you know, one hypothesis from a while ago from Gould, actually, was do changes only happen at speciation events? I thought that things sort of stay as they are, they don't really evolve much, and then during a speciation event, boom, you're in a new environment, all your genes sort of not correlated anymore, and you can hop into a new character state. And so this idea that change only happens at these speciation events. Well, how can you test that? Well, if that were true, then the amount of time between speciation events shouldn't matter. All that should matter in terms of the amount of change is how many speciation events happened. And so there's ways of stretching the tree to test that. Okay. Um, it's also used in things like selective optima. So I see, you know, one group of lizards, you know, is small, one group of lizards is large, and they occur in different habitats. Can I say um, is that they're definitely evolving towards two separate optima? Or is it sort of by chance they're sort of evolving all over this continuous space? So you can test that by stretching trees. Okay. So, so here's one I, I developed a few years ago where you can say, is this group evolving faster than this group? And what you do is just apply different stretching parameters to those different groups and try stretching the tree and fitting those parameters. Okay? And you just sort of plug and chug into an equation. Okay. We can do discrete character reconstruction. Right? So continuous like things like body size or that frog call, we can do discrete like you know, orange being orange colored or not orange colored. Another thing that people don't always get, but we've, we've known really for over 25 years now, is that species aren't independent. Right. Why is independence important in stats?
that's what I think. So you make comparisons, right? And so you know that all your data are sort of equally distributed. Right, if I was trying to see, um, does eating candy cause cancer? Right, and I had a bunch of random people from the population, and I had one family that all had cancer and all ate, all ate candy bars. Right, well they could all have cancer from shared genetic factors. Right, just that one family. They're not independent of each other. Right, so but I would get the wrong answer perhaps by having that, you know, big, bit of, big bunch of correlated points in my sample. Um, phylogenetics is a way of avoiding that. So here's an example of leaf size versus leaf lifespan. And this says that the longer the leaves live, the smaller they are. Does this make sense? It seemed weird to me. You think, okay, I'm making this huge leaf. I'm going to toss it right away. There's this little tiny cheap leaf. I keep it for a long time. I think the opposite, right? And what these people do is combine this data <coughs> with a tree. Okay, and, and this was the tree they actually used. Okay, and got this result. Okay, so here we see correlation. Is there correlation here? Nope. And what happens? What's this magic X point? And you just run for his conifers. Right. So in their particular tree, they have conifers and angiosperms. Right? And what they're looking at is the change happening along here. And what happens is angiosperms have big leaves that are short lived. Um, but even things that aren't deciduous, they'll have huge turnover rates. Whereas conifers have tiny needles, right? That they hold on to for a long time. And so this entire pattern was based on this comparison. Because I compare this with this, and this with this, and this with this. In all those cases, I'm just doing this one change. And this one evolutionary event is counted way too much by ignoring the phylogeny over here. Once you incorporate the phylogeny, and I look at this versus this only, this versus this only, this versus this only, and so forth, the mythical infinite contrasts, I find the only case that really shows this well is this comparison right here. Okay. So I would have made, you know, so here we would have had some elaborate theory about, you know, why leaves have to turn over, and energy costs, and all this stuff. Here it is, oh, it's just noise, just one change. This doesn't always happen. Sometimes you get the right answer if you ignore the tree. But sometimes you don't. It's always good to know about the tree. So anytime you're dealing with multiple species, you have to take this into account. So if you don't, people will be angry at you if they review often. Not as much as it should be, but it's coming. OK, what else can you do with the tree? <coughs> well, here we have a case. So here is the Hawaiian Islands. Okay. What do you know about the history of the Hawaiian Islands? Anyone? So this one is old, 5.1 million years. This one is young. They're like moving like that way as the volcano, the active volcano like creates volume losses. Exactly. Like time moving. Yep. So under the crust there, there's something like a blowtorch, a little volcano that's always going. And as the plate moves over this volcano, it starts, you know, releasing lava and make, building up an island. And then finally it moves off that hot spot and starts eroding down. Right. So these, you know, they're extinct, extinct, like you know, undersea mounts over here, and to the southeast is actually a new island coming up. So you just invent, you know, buy real estate there, you know, in a few million years your kids will be rich. Right. Um, but it's still rising up. Okay. And <coughs> this sort of tells us how old groups on these islands can be. So you can have a radiation on this on this island group until it emerges above the water, at least for terrestrial organisms, right? And so what you can do is figure out. You know, we know what these divergences are between these islands, how old, how old they occurred, and then look at the tree and figure out when these splits happened. And the splits correlate with the island splits. Okay? And this suggests that what the flies are doing is hopping 
from one island to every new, to new, new islands as they go. Okay, so it's true this time. So it's pretty cool. You can you can estimate you know when these splits happen, how quickly flies are evolving, that sort of thing from these islands. Okay. Here's another question: How big were dinosaur genomes? Right. Why do we care about genome size? Well, in first case, in many cases, we think of when you have genome duplications, it makes you have a whole set of redundant genes that you can then tweak to use other things. Okay, and gene, this gene duplication is a big important, pro, important process. So, like, if you think about our hemoglobin genes, right? We don't have just one hemoglobin, we have multiple hemoglobins. And when you're a fetus, you have a different hemoglobin than your mother does. And the, hemoglo the hemoglobin a fetus has does a better job sucking oxygen. So, it can steal oxygen from a mother's blood, which makes a lot of sense if you're a placental mammal. Right, and that's from a, a copy of the gene that then diverged slightly. Okay, so figuring out the history of those copies matters a lot. But also, in this case, we know that many flying species have small genome sizes. You know, it's because DNA is so heavy. I mean, who knows? We don't really have a good explanation for that. It might be due to the metabolic rate. Right? Um, <coughs> but to answer, to answer that question, we might look at you know, the history of genome size in dinosaurs. So some of them became flying. Did they first evolve a low genome size because they were high metabolic rate? Or did they only evolve small genome size after they started flying? Right. Well, what you can do is you can do a reconstruction using extant organisms. And actually, there's some information about genome size from cell size. Okay. And so you can do a correlation there um, and figure out what ancestral cell size, uh, ancestral genome size might have been, and then reconstruct on this tree genome size. Okay. And you can see that. Many dinos actually had small genomes. So cool that you know small genome size pre predated flight in this case. Okay, okay next question. So make a prediction. What should evolve faster, trees or herbs, like non-woody things? Herbs. herbs? Why? Okay. So you have more turnover and maybe more chance for, for substitutions. Good. Well, let's do a test. What does this say? So these are all excellent organisms, that's a hint. These are all things that exist right now. Herbs, right? How do you know that? <coughs> well, that's one. So that's the speciation rate, which is different from the amount of change per species. Yeah, but you're right. I mean, they, they have a higher speciation rate. Higher the stream. Higher substitution rate. So substitution rate is the rate at which you substitute an A to a G, or so forth, through DNA, right? And you see it from this plot. You also see it from this tree. How do you see it from this tree? Oh, more branches? Not quite. More branches really relates to the, speci the speciation rate, not, not the substitution rate. So here, branch length means amount of change. Amount of change on that branch. Mm -hmm. Right, so the, the brown ones, the trees, have lots of short branches, right? Because we know if we plot this according to time, they should all be on a circle of the same diameter, right? They all had a common ancestor here. They all sampled zero years ago. Right, so they should all be equal length from the root to the tips. What we see in the woody ones is much shorter than for a lot of the herbaceous ones, which means the woody ones have had fewer changes leading to current species than the herbaceous ones have. Okay, and that's that's how they figured out these rates. Okay, so even not having to like do some, do evolution in the lab to watch changes, you know, over these you know, deep time scales of tens of millions of years, we can figure out. Yep, on average, herbs evolve faster than trees, okay, using, these, using this information. Another thing you can look at is gene transfer. Right? So gene transfer matters a lot. So we have you know, antibiotic resistant bacteria in our hospitals. Well, how do they get antibiotic resistance? One way is through novel mutations. Right? So they start to turn off a pump that will pump an antibiotic so they don't get antibiotics in them anymore, that sort of thing. Another way is bacterial sometimes 
find you know DNA floating around and say, oh, good, it, yummy, suck it in, and then start using that DNA. Okay, it's called transferring plasmids. Okay, and we can estimate how often this sort of gene transfer happens. Another way, there are other mechanisms of gene transfer too. Um, using phylogeny, looking at you know which gene, looking at the overall species history and looking at genes that conflict with that, that, that suggest they were jumped over from one species to another species. Okay. We can also look at things like um, when duplications happened, right? So with plants, sometimes what you have is when different species will try to mate, the will end up having errors in meiosis and have a doubling of, of genome size, okay? And we can see lots of evidence of these doublings, okay, using phylogenetics. Phylo we can look at things like evolvability, okay? So if you think about most, most quadrupeds, right, think of a cow, right? If it could have evolved really long forelimbs and really short hind limbs, that'd probably not work well, right? The cow, like, I can't eat the grass, okay? So it's evolutionary, you know, more fit if, you know, the genes that affect forelimb length and hind limb length are correlated, or even in the same genetic control, right? But we also think in primates, things like gibbons, Right, they have these really long forelimbs and short hind limbs, right? And they can swing through the trees. Right? Well, the way you could get that is by breaking this coupling between forelimb and hind limb evolutionary rates. Right? And so this what this does is look at this correlation <coughs> and see in things like you know, some of these, the correlation is pretty is pretty low. Okay, so you can say, oh that's like they can evolve separately. So you can see when this change happened. The thing you with phylogeny is look at evolutionary history, right? So we're going to talk in a few lectures about biogeography, right? There's basically this, this crazy idea that the continents are moving, moving around. And this came out in the 50s, and was like, no, no way this is true. I mean, you know, it's rock solid, you know, rock solid, we're on land. And instead of, you know, but we see, oh, well, there are species on different continents. How do they get there? Well, there are these land bridges that popped up, and they ran across, and then went back down, okay? Or they rode rafts or something. And, you know, but now we know that continents are actually moving and spreading. There were occasional land bridges, like the Bering Land Bridge, and there also there are occasional dispersals across rafts and things like that. But a lot of the patterns we see come from things riding continents and the continents splitting up and speciation of it happening. All right? And now we can actually directly measure the continents moving, which is kind of cool. Um, <coughs> but you can plot on a tree where things occurred and figure out how they move from continent to continent. You know, when was the Bering Land Bridge? Yeah. When did the Isthmus of Panama appear? Okay. And that's sort of a question you can address using trees. Okay. We can look at you know, smaller scale evolutionary patterns of you know, here's where different species occur. Right? And say, okay, where did their parental species occur? Where did they diverge from? And you can say, oh look, you know, they occur on either side of a new mountain range. So maybe the mountain range caused an allopatric speciation event. you can look at um, ecological traits, okay? So here you see um, a group of plants, and here shows the temperature range, and here shows the precipitation. Okay. And what I see is that there's been this divergence in temperature range. So some adapt to temperate climates that have lots of variation in range, like we have here, right? And some occur only at places that have small changes in temperature, right? Whereas the precipitation, doesn't seem to be the divergence, right? So it seems like they've sort of diversified on the axis of temperature, not on the axis of precipitation. We don't have desert specialist clades versus rainforest specialist clades. Okay, we just have temperature specialists. It's still something about how things evolve in terms of the ecological niche. Okay. Okay. Fish jaws. So people here who work on this area too. Um, so we have sunfish. And sunfish have a variety of jaw shapes, okay? And then you have basses, and bass will have sort of one shape. And the hypothesis is that basses, basically they're just designed, they evolved to really do a good job eating minnows. They're really good at eating minnows, so their jaws are adapted really well towards eating minnows. Whereas sunfish, some graze, some eat snails, some eat things in the water, and so there's a fa you, you estimate this is a faster evolutionary rate as this one evolved to eat snails better, this one evolved to eat plants better, and so forth. 
that you can test this directly using a phylogeny. Right? And so here we see a rate of morphological evolution here and the rate of suction index, so how well it sucks in food. So fish actually don't bite things usually. They sort of open their mouths and suck in a bunch of water and then close it. So I'll show you some cool videos later. Um, and so here we see that they diversified a lot in terms of how they suck. Right? So sunfish you know, vary a lot in how, in how they do that, and it's evolved very quickly, whereas basses in this other group haven't changed very much. Okay. Rafflesia. So the world's biggest flower, it's a giant flower, it smells like rotting flesh, okay, and it's fly pollinated. Right? How did that evolve? And so what these people did was, you, first of all, evolution, estimate the tree, okay, and here's the big ones. And here this shows flower diameter in millimeters. You see, 0 0.7, 2, you know, 4, 305, 140, 175. And they figured out how did that evolve, and they found there was a fast rate of evolution right here. So you had you know, really small flower, small flower, small flower, small ancestor, and then boom, a big rate of evolution, and it slows down again. Okay. So you can start wondering what happened here that made them evolve so quickly. I can generate new hypotheses. I'm just going to figure out something about history from this. Okay. Here's a group I used to work on. These are called honeypot ants. And these aren't upside down. That's how they actually live in their calories. And they, li they live in the desert. And what they'll do is they'll store nectar or insect juices inside the abdomen, or the gasters, effectively the abdomen, of some of the worker ants. Okay? They have other cool behavior too, like ritual tournaments and things like that. Um, and they actually were described, they used to sell them in Mexico City on little pieces of paper as sort of candy. You just get it. And, you know, cause it's, like nectar, it's like honey almost, right? It's actually with extra protein. Um, so I actually haven't tasted these. But some of, some of these, so these only come out at night. These only come out during the day. And then, they, I mean, I've been out in the desert collecting them, and you'll touch a rock, and the rock is painful to touch for any minimum of time. These are just things that are happily running on the rock. Right? And these come out only in morning and evening. Okay? And the funny thing is, if you take these out and take them outside and hold them outside during the day, they'll die in 10 minutes. Okay? This is a fairly closely related group of organisms. So how do they transition between these three states, being diurnal in the hot, hot desert, nocturnal, or crepuscular. And you might think, well, probably what's going to happen, I mean, do you, do you think they went from diurnal directly to nocturnal? Probably not. They probably went this way, right? How can you test that? Well, if you use a phylogeny and then estimate rates on that phylogeny of the character change, you can then figure out which model fits best. And the best model is this one, right, where it seems to be transitioned across this way rather than directly. Okay. So over 10 million years of history, you can figure out what the average rates are for changes. Okay. You can also look at things like evolution of venom. Okay. So it's sort of straightforward, instead of state reconstruction, where you say, okay, these are all venomous, these are all venomous, when did venom evolve? And so you can then go back and predict when venom evolved. And actually, there was a really cool study with um, snakes and lizards, where they found out that Actually, lizards are ancestrally, many of them are venomous. Okay, they found some venom proteins. And they look and find little glands that secrete a little bit of venom in, in lizards. So we know about like Gila monsters and things like that. But actually, many lizards have very, very weak venom, which they figured out from phylogenetics. Kind of cool. Okay. It's also useful when you, people get bitten by snakes, say. So if you're bitten by a snake and they have antivenin, they'll have antivenin from different species other than the one that bit you. Which one should you use? Well, you should use antivenin for the most closely related to snake. And so you can use the phylogeny to figure that out and actually save someone's life using a tree, in theory. Um, <coughs> the thing to do with phylogeny is looking at rates of evolution, sort of what people were asking about during the, that plant thing. Right? So here we have a whole bunch of vertebrates. And color here shows number of taxa. And also, these numbers show groups that are evolving really quickly or really slowly in terms of number of species. OK, you find, you know, Crocodilians evolving very slowly with the number of species, but some birds are. No, it's not all birds, okay? It's not um, ducks, things like that, but it's neoaves, okay? Which are perching birds and relatives, so like robins, cardinals, that sort of thing, okay? Are evolving very, very quickly, okay? And so you can use them to figure out why might, why might this be happening? 
as soon as I'm doing like system comparisons like we talked about the other day, right? Where you can try fitting character models and saying which character is leading to my diversification rate and so forth. Okay, so things about like what's happening right now using phylogenies. Okay, are there any questions about any of this? And this will be com keep coming up because this is a, you know, the same way we use fossils for information. Phylogenetics is another way of getting information about what's happening millions of years in the past, right? So this will keep coming up in class, and you keep seeing phylogenies all the time. Okay. Thank you.